Thanks. Um, I, I want to uh, probably convince you guys that I'm completely crazy by the end of this, and so uh, please feel free to answer, ask any questions you might have. Uh, the more interaction we have, the, the better I like it, the more fun it is, because nobody likes being told stuff all the time. So um, with that, if you can tune in and listen, Okay, that's a little weird, but I think it's a good it's a good place to start. That woman is over 90 years of age, 92, if she would allow me to tell you. Um, what on earth is it that would inspire a woman to call her CPA, her attorney, and sing happy birthday happy birthday to him on his birthday or close? She knew which day it was, but the phone wasn't being answered. Yet. So she left me that as a voicemail. What on earth would inspire them to do that? Well, lots of things, I think. But mostly, she feels comfortable with me as a professional. She feels comfortable with me as a friend and a trusted person that she can call and just be herself. She happens to be the youngest of eight children. She's also the last one that's alive. Uh, but I've now dealt with three generations in that family. She's been a client for more than 40 years, which is kind of scary, and it tells you that I'm an old guy. But, <laughs> but it's true. So what is it that does that? Um, and where are you? I, I, I have not had an opportunity to visit with, with hardly any of you about you know, your life and what you're doing and why, why you're showing up in a place like this. But <clears throat> I wanted to visit with you about what it is that inspires the level of trust and friendship and companionship that you can have with clients. Um, you have to make a decision to be in the kind of practice that I'm in. Uh, you will have, when you graduate with your degree, when you get a CPA certificate, if that's what your goal is, you'll have lots of opportunities. You will never be without a job, uh, particularly if you are involved in a tax practice. Uh, for me, tax practice uh, has been great because it's a completely transportable skill. Um, you can take it anywhere and do anything. But it's not something that you can casually wander into and do some days and not do some days. You have to understand and practice that craft pretty seriously. So where does that, that come from? Uh, I was visiting with your professor beforehand and, and it just it happened to come up about decision making. You have to make a decision in your life uh, whether or not to associate with a particular firm, whether or not to hang out your own shingle, and run your own business, and there's no right or wrong answer. It has to be what you decide to do though. If you just sort of think, well, I got a job over here, and you sort of drift into it, you know, are you going to be fulfilled as a person, as an individual, as a professional? Maybe, but mostly you're just sort of drifting, and, and that's not a whole lot of fun. If you are as fortunate as I was to just have a, a grand epiphany where the, the moonbeam comes in through the window and the harp strums in the background and you say, aha, I know what I'm going to do the rest of my life. This is what I want to do, where I'm going to go. If you're lucky enough to have that happen, well, good for you. Uh, it happened to me, and I've been thrilled about it ever since. Uh, once you make that decision, though, then what do you do? Well, you have to prepare. You guys are at least preparing for that now, whether you decide to pursue that as a career forever or not. Well, you know, who knows? But you have to prepare. You have to prepare mentally, physically, academically, uh, and be ready to apply <clears throat> that preparation uh, to, the, to the craft. You have to, as soon as you have made the decision you want to do it, and you're prepared, you've taken the exam, you've got your sheepskin, you've got your certificate, you're ready to go forward, you have to have a great deal of perseverance and diligence and dedication 
and just stay with it because there are going to be days that you just don't really feel like going to the office. You'd really much rather go to the ranch and dig post holes or whatever, or at least that's my problem. Um, but you have to be able to persevere and you have to have the, the depth and breadth of character to be able to stick with it and know that you're doing a competent and professional job day in and day out. So anyway, that's why I want to visit with you. If that is completely off topic and not what you want to talk about, if you want to talk about the accumulation of stable isotopes in Lake Superior forage fish, we'll go over there and talk about the sciences <laughs> instead of uh, the, the accounting profession and, and the law profession and so forth. I'm happy to talk about that. Are we kind of on point with what you want to talk about? <coughs> Anybody want to walk out now? <laughs> it's okay. I don't take it personally. Uh, you, you develop, anytime you, you speak particularly to, to younger folks, now that's annoying. So, um, in fact, I can do even better. I'll just turn it completely, totally off. Um, once we got past Laverne, that's all. That's all that phone can bring me for this, this period of time. So where do you start in making that decision or having that epiphany? Uh, how can you do that? It really it kind of depends on your life experience. Um, how many of you worked before you went to college, like when you were in high school? Yeah, most of I like it. Like Leah said, I've been continuously employed by a third person since I was 14. That's great experience. How many of you work while you're in college? Probably most everybody, okay? Well, uh, there's so many folks out there today that don't really want to take that job because they don't know if it's right for them, and I just want to slap them, I, you know? <laughs> it's, just the, it's like the, the way you know whether or not you like something the way you get to the point where you can have an epiphany and make a decision about what you affirmatively want to do forever is you have those experiences. You know, it, 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 if you're shoveling the barn, cleaning out the stalls, and it smells bad, you can say, I know I don't want to do that forever, okay? Same thing if you're working, I don't know, theater, grocery store, whatever job you had, those experiences are all absolutely worthwhile, and you will use those experiences uh, in your in your profession, uh, I I started off as an auto mechanic. I wasn't sure I wanted to go to college. Um, Vietnam sort of inspired me to to maybe get a deferral and go to college for a while. Uh, I got lucky on the uh, on the draft number. Uh, they got within two of my number, uh, but they didn't take me. So I went to work for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service and almost went anyway. But those experiences were fabulous because every single one of them had something to do with some element of some industry somewhere. And in private practice, I have folks that are financial people, folks that are sheet metal mechanics at the local body shop, uh, folks that have net worth of maybe negative 200 to over 100 million. And I can communicate with them and relate to them because of those experiences in life outside of the profession. Being a well-balanced, well-person, not strictly book nerd is a really, really good thing if you're going to be out there and be in, in private practice. Once you get to practice, and it doesn't really matter whether you're in a larger firm or a small firm or on your own. Uh, you should look to those who can possibly mentor you and advise you and give you the sage wisdom of their many years. Uh, I was blessed with uh, several encounters. Uh, one of them was a fellow named Jay Manley Head. Mr. Head's been dead for a long time. But he was an old time, scruffy, wire-haired lawyer that said, just one thing you have to remember, if you take care of your clients, your clients will take care of you. And I have found that to be largely true. If your clients feel like you have given them your best, given them competent advice, um, they're not going to fuss or whine about paying a fair and reasonable price for that service. 
and so that's that's one little mantra to sort of put in the back of your head and remember. Take care of your clients. Your clients will take care of you. The other one that uh, some of my staff get tired of me saying, or used to, the current staff is much, much better about it, but uh, I tell them there's only three things you have to remember about being in business, at least from the standpoint of getting started, and that is you have to get up in the morning. You have to get up, you have to dress up, and you have to show up. And by show up, I mean you have to be prepared, engaged, and ready to go. Um, so that, that kind of distills it down uh, pretty quickly. What does it mean to show up? Well, that means that you have to be willing and able to, to run the operation. Um, the number one complaint about attorneys, other than all of the lawyer jokes aside, which I've all heard and actually think they're pretty funny, uh, but the biggest complaint is they don't call me back. They don't respond. They're not listening to me. I can't ever get through to them. If you can follow the notion that you're not going to let the sun set on a voicemail or an email, if you're going to answer them all, sometimes the sun will set. It may be before midnight. But answer those calls. Even, even if that answer is, I can't talk about this, I don't have a clue, I'll call you tomorrow, it doesn't really matter what the answer is if you will just simply respond to the clients because then the clients begin to believe that you are paying attention to them. Uh, even if you can't pay attention to them right then. The next thing, of course, is we've got deadlines. So April the 15th is kind of coming up pretty soon. Uh, we're already past uh, March the 15th. Then we'll have one for estimated payments on June 15th. Oh yeah, that's after the one for Texas Franchise Tax Returns on May 15th. So, there's always a deadline of some sort that we're trying to meet. Do your debt level best to meet those deadlines. It, it will make a difference if you can. Now, there are a lot of clients that don't care. They say, fine, extend me, whatever. Or there's some external uh, factor, such as uh, they don't get their K-1s until mid-July. There's not anything you can do about that. But most people would prefer not to have an extension. and. Uh, as soon as they realize that that extension is an extension of time to file the return, not an extension of time to pay the tax, um, they really just get it over with. The other advantage of getting it over with is there is a statute of limitations, a time period during which the Internal Revenue Service can review that return and make adjustments. And it's three, generally, it is three years from the later of the due date of the return or the date the return is actually filed. That due date of the return includes extensions. So if you do not extend, your statute of limitations is going to run three years later on April the 15th. If you extend it, well, you're giving them an extension too uh, till October 15th. Uh, so people who understand that generally would just as soon go ahead and get it over with if that was entirely possible. In the process of getting it over with, though, a commitment to excellence to doing the job right, to not having to amend the return unless uh, it's something that neither you nor your client had knowledge of before the fact, um, really makes a huge difference. Uh, it, I can't tell you how embarrassing it is to have the client call up and say, you know, on this partnership 1065, I don't think those partner numbers ought to be negative because nobody else has negative numbers and we didn't give them a distribution and you look at that and have one of those, oh, primary moments. Uh, those are really uncomfortable, especially when it's a $32 million sale. Uh, correcting that would be uh, something that, it's an embarrassment you would want to save yourself. Um, and when you're reviewing those returns and preparing those returns, you will sometimes see things such as, well, gosh, you know, they've got, uh, this set of facts and these circumstances over here, and if they do it a little bit differently, gee, you know, they would have saved 5% on their taxes. Uh, or they wouldn't have been subject to self-employment tax if they'd set it up this way uh, because it really is interest income not associated with the trader business and you shouldn't have to pay tax, uh, self-employment tax on that. So those are technical things, but keep your eyes open, be aware. That's part of being engaged <laughs> and communicating with the client uh, as you go along. Uh, it, it's just, it's a, a critical facet. 
And then probably, well, I, you cannot understate the, the need for technical confidence. You've got to be prepared. You've got to understand. And there are going to be a whole lot of things you don't know out there. Lord knows I learn something new almost every day. Uh, you have to read the instructions for the forms. Believe it or not, that's really a great source. Uh, it'll give you all kinds of hints. And you say, ah, oh, you know, it's, it's real aha moments. Just do it. It's investing time, and you'd probably rather be out there playing disc golf. But, you know, it's, it's really a, it's a, a terrific thing to do to pay attention to all of the potential combinations and permutations of your facts of the client and clients who see that, gosh, you know, if I set up a, the, an LLC, well, here, here's an example. <coughs> Say you have somebody that comes in and says, you know, I've just come in with some money. I want to invest in some real estate. And I found this piece of property. It's really great. I'm going to go buy it. He said, oh, wait a minute. Is there a better way to do that? Well, from a tax standpoint, maybe there's not. You know, they're going to get the rent income. They're going to have the depreciation that's going to offset a lot of that income. Um, not a bad thing. But what if, uh, what if that piece of property you buy is a small apartment complex and it's got an unattended swimming pool and some kid drowns in it? Oh, what happened to your inheritance? It's going to get lost because you're going to get sued, and the cost of defending that suit is probably equal to or greater than your insurance policy. So what can you do to protect that? Well, if you are in tune to those types of questions, like what can I do to protect that investment, then you can tell them, well, maybe, maybe what we do is we set up an LLC over here and we put your cash into that and you invest part of it in a stock portfolio and part of it in publicly traded securities of, of various types, and you also invest in a mortgage loan. And the mortgage loan is to another LLC that buys that real estate. So that initial LLC is funded with maybe 5% of the purchase price of that property, and the rest of it is funded by a mortgage from this other company. Then what happens when you have a calamitous event in the LLC that owns that real estate company? A couple of things happen. First of all, you personally, or your client personally, hopefully you, <laughs> uh, but the client personally is insulated from the liability unless they're the ones that took down the fence around the swimming pool and they had some personal involvement in the tort that gave rise to the liability. They can't escape that uh, even by putting the shell of the the uh, LLC around it, but in most circumstances, they'll be shielded from the liability. The second thing that happens is if the plaintiff in that case wins, yes, the property is exposed, and yes, whoever committed the act that gave rise to the liability is probably exposed, but gosh, you know, if they foreclose on that property to satisfy their claim in excess of your limits of liability, all they can get is the net after they pay off the mortgage. So 95% of your equity in that property has been protected by thoughtful planning in advance. And so that's really one of the professional challenges you have out there is to keep trying to turn on that light bulb, find a better way of doing things, find the ideas that are going to serve your clients. Um, and the more experiences you have, the more risks you recognize up front and can plan for and avoid uh, by, by uh, whatever legitimate means there, there might be. You cannot, however, uh, take that phone, well, you can take the phone call, but you can't take action on the phone call where the guy calls in and says, you know, I've got a bunch of money here and um, I, I want to invest it and have interest in dividends and I want to use a trust and I want to let the trust pay the income taxes on it so that when it gets distributed to me, I don't have to put it on my personal 1040 that I file with my wife because I don't want her to know about that income. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then when he says, oh, you know how they are, I go, no, let's not go there. <laughs> you know, that's not, a, not the way you should live your life. You have to have some hopefully competent and uh, tactful response to those people, and you will get those calls. 
you will you will get the guy that comes in someday with a bag full of cash and sits it on your desk and says, I want you to do a return, but we can't talk about my gambling winnings. Those are, you know, that, that was a, a game in a state that doesn't allow gambling. No, you can't do it. You just can't do it. There is so much good business and so many solid clients out there that you don't need to take that. And it's just not even, it, it's just off the charts. Well, how do you develop that character? And, and what does it mean? Well, you know, <laughs> Professor Falk's paper is really one of the best capsulizations of, of what you need to do that I've ever read. It's, it's on point and succinct, and that's remarkable. Now, part of the reason I chuckled as I read through it, and I'm not saying this just to schmooze, I, I promise. <laughs> You, you guys are too young to even remember, other than the name, who Gerald Ford was. Gerald Ford was a president of the United States at one point. And during a, uh, an interview, uh, one of the reporters was kind of criticizing him for um, taking a position which showed a great deal of character and honor. And the reporter said to Mr. Ford, President Ford, Aren't you being a little bit of a Boy Scout about that? Well, I don't think that reporter understood that Gerald Ford was an Eagle Scout. <laughs> and Gerald Ford's response was, well, sir, a Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Isn't that <coughs> the kind of person you want as your president? Let's not talk about politics today, but I thought that was a marvelous response, and it parallels that paper, and it parallels my own belief in how you have to run your practice. Uh, those are uh, characteristics of a successful person, uh, and you're going to be successful in life. You could be possibly more successful in business if you were willing to you know, enter into that gray area a little bit, but it's not worthwhile. Uh, you guys are young, you're sharp, you have great memories. That memory will never be good enough to be a good liar. You will always get caught. Uh, so don't do it. Uh, aside from being morally wrong, it's a highly risky uh, adventure. Within a firm, uh, you know, again, I had to laugh when I read this right side of the line business because you are a successful manager when you can lead by example. Um, my personal experience was with the Army and Air Force Exchange Service in retail operations, and for a portion of the time I was there, um, I was a retail operations manager, store manager. Um, I had about 30 employees out there. But, you know, if I showed up first, if I, as the manager, was not reluctant at all to go into the bathroom and scrub the toilets or plunge it when it stopped up, you know, that was leading by an example. The people who are willing to roll up their sleeves, attack the task at hand, uh, are going to be more successful in being successful leaders. How can you supervise someone? I, there's, a, uh, there's a company in Dallas, the entrepreneur there, paid many thousands of dollars to train, well he spent about a half a million dollars on his, on his uh, laser uh, metal cutting machine, and then he paid about $10,000 to have a member of his staff go and learn how to operate it, learn the software, learn the procedures. He was the boss, but he didn't have a clue how to turn that machine on. Well, the employee later came in and said, you know, I want about a 40% raise. He said, well, I can't do that. He said, well, I can't work for you. I'll go to somebody else. Well, the employer who didn't know how to operate his own equipment or the employer who doesn't know how to run his own business or doesn't know the technical aspects of his own business is putting themselves at jeopardy for being held hostage by their employees. Uh, not that any employee would ever intentionally do that, but it happened in Dallas. And so I encourage you, as you become the managers, as you become the entrepreneurs, don't put yourself at risk. Be technically competent, 
uh, and reasonable and fair and pay that employee well, but don't be held hostage by them. And when you first go into the firms, or whoever your employer is, as the employee, don't pull that kind of shenanigan. Don't, don't try to blackmail your boss into giving you a raise. That's not a good idea. It's, it's, not, it's, quite, it's going to pass, uh, it, it, and it won't, won't be particularly good for you. Um, you know, there's a reason that, that trustworthy is the first point of the scout law. And that's because trustworthiness is paramount in everything that you do within your profession. If your if your um, credible client has worries about whether or not you are trustworthy, that's not a relationship that's going to last. They're not going to be sure that they want to pay your fee year after year after year after year. And when I talk about that year after year, it's it it, it brings to mind my own experiences in that. Um, you know, something I really need to do is I need to figure out what the average duration of my clients is. But there are clients that have been, there are clients that were clients of my father before our firm, so over 50 years. Uh, but most of them, I, out of, well just think about tax returns, out of maybe as many as 400 returns, how many of them don't return next year? Okay, some of them die, some of them move out of state. Actually those that have moved out of state I'm still doing them. <laughs> They're in Tennessee, California, Oklahoma, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and you know they still mail their stuff in and we still do them. People don't like changing their professionals and if that professional is trustworthy and reasonable on their fees, they're not gonna go anywhere and they will refer their friends to you. And um, I was relating earlier that, that the uh, people from Yelp are just killing me. I, they just call me constantly. The the professionals at the at, at Yelp, you know, they want us to do another splash on the website, or they want to add some credibility, or fix the search engine so we pop up as number one on the Google searches. I don't know. Please, I don't want to do that. The vast referral of our clients come from personal referral from our other clients. They they feed themselves, and it has been. You know, talk about the synergy between firms. If you can find a, uh, a law firm that practices in business law or estate planning or wills uh, to be simpatico with, that's a great, great relationship because they're always going to be setting up LLCs and partnerships and things, and they have to have some professional to handle that compliance work. Similarly, and we've got somewhere I don't know whether it's 6,000 now or not, but it's in the upper 5,000s of clients in our database that, you know, somebody's always got a kid that's in trouble or uh, an IRS audit or a divorce or a real estate purchase going on, and it just, it feeds itself. And so if you develop the core uh, clientele that you know and love and you can trust them to be honest and trustworthy in all that they do with you, then that's a relationship that is going to endure for decades. And, uh, it, and not only that, it's really rewarding. One of the things that night of my epiphany, <laughs> I said, I want to choose who I work for. That's it. In a private practice, you get to choose who you work for. You don't have to take everything that comes through the door. If somebody is, if I have this goofy set of rules about who can and can't be my client, and you'll laugh about it. I know everybody I've told to laughs about it, but I can tell you that if a guy comes in, he's wearing pointy toe cowboy boots with silver tips on them, he can't be my client. That's just, you know, that's based on experience. Uh, that's just one example. I have a whole long list of people who can't be my client. It has nothing to do with race, creed, color, uh, color skin. It has nothing to do with anything that is a common, quote, discrimination, but Every one of them is based on experience. Uh, you know, if the guy's wearing a Rolex watch, I'm gonna look at him twice. If he's wearing a Rolex watch with diamond studs on it, I'm gonna look at him three times. If he comes in wearing a diamond studded band, or I'm sorry, diamond studded face with a gold nugget band, I will probably escort him from the office. I don't want him as a client. Because he's got more money than sense about, you know, how he ought to lead his life. And that, that sort of thing just doesn't impress me. So that's my, like I say, it's, it's my goofy set of rules, but uh, I have fun. I love my clients. My clients 
seem to like me okay. They call me on my birthday for Pete's sakes. Uh, one thing that you can never do is compromise that moral judgment, though. If, you, if it doesn't feel right, if you're unsure about it, call an attorney. Get a second opinion. Talk to your state board. Try, you know, find out whether you're just not reading it right or if it's really on the edge. Stay away from the edge. Uh, you know, we all saw the, the, the uh, couple uh, out in California that got too close to the edge while trying to take a selfie uh, several months ago. Stay away from the edge. I tell my daughter that all the time. Hadn't kept her from jumping out of airplanes or riding her bicycle from Boston to Santa Barbara, but you know, she, uh, she does that. Um, in the whole process, I made the comment yesterday to a client that called late in the day and he was saying, well, do you, do you think you can look at it tomorrow? I said, no, tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow I am leaving, I'm going to Colleen, and then I'm going to go to the ranch and I'm gonna sleep for 48 hours because I had not seen, I had not been out of the office during daylight hours in 12 days. And that's a function of the, uh, of the season. And you know, I, I don't expect my employees to work the same hours. Uh, I don't expect them to, to follow that part of the example because it is crazy. Uh, but I try to maintain balance. You've got to have exercise, you've got to have outside interests, uh, you've got to do other things. And it's, it doesn't matter what it is you're doing, it just has to be something different. Uh, go to Tasmania, uh, you know, take a flyer and, and uh, build, a, build a log cabin. I, you know, just do something that is completely different and completely off the chart for expectations. Uh, don't be the office nerd that just only lives for the office and maybe mows the yard on the weekends. Uh, there's a whole lot more to life than, than that. Um, after you spend all of that time with your clients, you build the, the practice, it's going well, you've got the balance in your life, uh, just remember that it's really important whenever you meet with your clients, there are some times that, you know, I, Shakespeare talks about death and taxes. Well, that's kind of where I live, is death and taxes, estate planning, trust, probate law, and taxation as a CPA. And it's, it's real steady work. But you also have to deal with families who are in crisis, you deal with leukemia, heart attacks, strokes, uh, deaths of a uh, youngster, deaths of your parents, and so, you know, it can be wearing on you mentally. And so you can't always end every conference or every conversation with each employee on a wonderful, happy note, but you can try. Even in the dark times, there will be something to lighten it up a little bit, and if you can do that, of course, in our office, we never laugh. Right. <laughs> These people know that it's a constant uh, uh, affliction. Uh, and I've, I've done a really good job of, of backing off on the puns in recent years. Uh, but we have a lot of fun, and you should keep it light. The, um, you should always end on a happy note. Surround yourself with happy people. Laugh at yourself, most of all. And help your clients see the bright side in their daily tasks. And that's really about all I had in terms of formality. And please, uh, if you want to know more about what adds balance to my life, I have pictures. No, I, <laughs> I actually I do. But, but it's, uh, please uh, ask your questions and take time for interaction. And I'm happy to visit with anybody anywhere, anytime, as you will undoubtedly be told by Leah and Erica. Uh, getting Leah, in fact, when she invited me to do this, she said, well, should I do this when it's time to quit? And I said, no, I promise you, I'll, I'll lock it down in 30 minutes and give plenty of time for open discussion. Um, because she recognized early on that it's a very, very dangerous thing to give a lawyer an open forum with no time limits. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? I want to know more about the rules. About the what? About what the rules are. Oh. <laughs>
Yes. Yes. Oh, where do I start? Um, number one. Number one. <laughs> if a person comes in and says, I am a professional horse breeder, I'm going to say, probably better find somebody that knows a lot about horses. I will tell you a story, and I, I know I know you guys are affiliated with A&M, but I'm going to tell the story anyway, because it's a true story. There was a uh, professor at Texas A&M uh, over in College Station who was an engineering professor, uh, good guy, and he decided as he retired that he was going to raise horses. <clears throat> and he, he had a, a, a real high flute and a mare and a colt, and he traded them and, and got five more mares, and then he spent a whole boatload of money on this stud horse. And uh, <clears throat> he'd been looking out his window, and he never saw anything happening out there. And he finally took the stallion in to the vet school at Texas A&M and had him checked. And um, the guys called him back up and said, well, you know, we're sorry we don't know how to tell you this, but this old horse is just shooting blanks. He's no good. He's not going to do anything. We recommend that you make him a gelding instead of a stallion. Uh, and if any of y'all don't know what that is, ask somebody else. <laughs> they, uh, and, and so he agreed to that. They did it. They sent the, the horse back. He was in his recovery phase, and he discovered that all five mares were pregnant. He didn't check the mares. He only had the stallion check. And he came to me as an attorney and wanted to know if he had a cause of action against the school. I said, well, you know, you were employed by the school, so you should have some familiarity with them, and you, you probably, they probably have a good defense against assumption of risk, because you knew or should have known the quality of their analysis. Um, so I don't think you have a cause of action. The horse, on the other hand, <laughs> may have a cause of action. He didn't think that one was funny. So this ending on a light note doesn't always work. Uh, but my experience with, with horse breeders and horse trainers, generally, there are some very credible people that are out there, but an awful lot of them are kind of like used car salesmen, uh, and I just I, I couldn't get comfortable with them. Uh, the guy with the silver tips on his boots, however, didn't race horses. Um, <clears throat> The other guy that I knew that had uh, silver tips on his boots that sort of lent me to making that rule uh, was a guy named George <clears throat> that I met when I was in uh, Syracuse. He was a truck driver out of the Tacone warehouse down in Philadelphia, and he would bring uh, deliveries to our store in Syracuse. And um, while we were unloading, okay, he always wore black jeans, his black cowboy boots with the silver tips and a black t-shirt. And he would occasionally, while we were unloading the truck, go out in the parking lot and practice with a bullwhip. And, you know, okay, so that's what he likes to do. That didn't bother me. But then he disappeared. A lot of times he would just unload, he would just unhitch the truck and then he would go and he'd come back in time to pick it up and, and return to Philadelphia. Well, I had my suspicions when he started doing that, but then he disappeared. And I asked about him and they said, oh, he doesn't work for us anymore. And that's about all they said. Well, two years later, I was at the New York State Fair, mm -hmm. and I'm walking down the midway, and, and I hear this, hey, Frank! I turn, and the guy that has that little booth with the, the milk bottles and the balls that you throw at it was George. Said, George, what are you doing working in a carnival? He says, well, it was the best job I could get. Well, I thought you were, a, I thought you had a, a, a commercial driver's license and was working. He says, well, yeah, that's before I made a mistake. Really? What kind of mistake did you make? <laughs> well, as it turned out, he'd been in the, uh, the penitentiary, the state penitentiary, for a couple of years because he uh, had driven a truck out to the docks there in New York City and picked up somebody else's trailer. And the mistake he made, the one he, he wouldn't admit that that was a mistake. The mistake was that he thought he was getting a load of beef during the beef crisis, and the prices were really high, and it was actually a truckload of bananas that were going to spoil very quickly uh, if he couldn't get rid of them. And he couldn't get rid of them, and during his attempt to get rid of the bananas, uh, he got caught. Um, so, you know, again, just don't put the, don't put the tips on those pointy boots. <laughs> um, 
I love the rodeo, and I grew up, my grandfather was one of the founding members of the American Shorthorn Breeders Association, so I've, I've been on farms and ranches all my life, and I don't wear and can't have and don't own pointy boots. Plenty of boots, just not the pointy ones. Anything else? You never know where these stories are going to go, by the way. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So I've been around campus for a little while, and most of, there's a lot of us that are graduating come May, and I think that something that several of my friends are dealing with is, when you say stay away from the edge, we all sort of feel like we're on the edge. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we gotta jump somewhere, and there's a lot of opportunity for people, maybe nervous opportunity for people, and I think that they struggle with, like you said, take it, go, run with it, you know, that balance and how you decide to move to San Antonio or, you know, come to that. Well, the good news is San Antonio is not Syracuse, New York. That's true. Uh, it's, it's a whole lot closer to home. Um, and, you know, you never know if it's gonna work out unless you try it. And uh, you just gotta go for it. Now, that, having said that, that's assuming that this isn't somebody who hires carnival people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, as long as it's a, a credible offer with incredible, you got to you got to go for it and try try it out. Uh, see if you're comfortable with the people. That's really as important as the compensation, maybe more so. Um, you know, I had an opportunity when I graduated from law school to go to work as a first year lawyer in San Francisco for one hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year, which back in nineteen seventy something was a lot of money. The alternatives were a private firm in Austin for about $45,000, and I chose to go to Austin because I figured at the end of the day, given the difference in the cost of living and the, and the taxation, I'd probably have more disposable income than the guy in San Francisco would have. Uh, it wasn't nearly as glitzy, but it felt right, it was more comfortable. And so let your, let your feelings have some say so in the decision. It, it's not all about maximizing the compensation. all I got. Well, it's never all. <laughs> but it's all, all I'll impose upon you unless you want to talk about something else. And, and uh, if anybody wants to know how to build a log cabin by their hands, I can, I can help you with that. Uh, that was, uh, well, we're talking about balance. That's one of the things that I did was I, for some stupid reason, thought, well, if our pioneer forefathers could go out in the Texas Hill Country and cut down trees and make log cabins that are so gorgeous, you know, the little dog trots with the breezeway in between them and such. Um, I decided to do that myself. I started off with a broad axe and a, a draw knife, peeling those logs. <laughs> that lasted about 14 hours. Uh, when I decided that if it was gonna be finished during my lifetime, I needed to fire up that chainsaw. Uh, and the chainsaw wasn't working for it, so I decided to buy a sawmill. Uh, and I did that, but eventually I manufactured all of the logs, dovetailed them and stacked them up and made a beautiful little cabin out of it. And that was something that, you know, if you, if you decide you want to do something, that kept, <laughs> that gave me balance for three and a half years. <laughs> so, uh, but it was still fun. It was a, it was great, uh, great fun. So. Anybody else? All right then. I, thank you for allowing me to impose on your uh, your Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm.